to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ bless me the god and father of our lord jesus christ who according to his abundant mercy has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. We welcome you today to our study of the book of Ephesians. We're so glad that you've joined us, and we want to encourage you to get your Bible and have it handy as we're going to look together in the Word of God today. Friend, we want you to know that our lesson today is being brought to you by individual Christians and members of the body of Christ. We'd love for you to visit the Lord's Church in your area. They'd be happy to have you, whether it be for their Bible study on Sunday or Wednesday. You'd be an honored guest at any of their assemblies. And friend, they'd love to sit down and talk to you more about the Word of God. You'll find people in the Lord's Church who are concerned about the souls of others, who love the Bible, and who want people to go to heaven. You've got a Bible question or you'd like to study further, we'd also love to help you here at the Gospel of Christ. You can visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com, and from that we just have a large variety of good Bible study material that'll help you. We have videos, audio lessons, transcripts, uh, check out our app on the Android and Google uh, and the iPhone store as well. Those are free and they're a great way to study the Word of God. And if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or any of our past lessons, they're available, available free from our website as a digital download or you'd like to have a hard copy, we can mail those to you. And you can see the information at the end of our program for that or you can visit our website. As we think today about the book of Ephesians, Friend, Ephesians and Colossians are kind of companion books. Colossians exalts the Christ of the church, while the book of Ephesians exalts the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. They complement each other with such beautiful themes. One of the key words in the book of Ephesians, in fact, is the word in Christ. This word will occur some, or this phrase will occur some 20 times in the book of Ephesians. Like we mentioned in Ephesians 1 3, all spiritual blessings are ours in Christ. There's no better place in all the world to be than to be in the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the key verses. Verses is found in Ephesians 3, verse 20 and 21. God's eternal plan and eternal purpose was to spread the gospel to all through the church. The church is the eternal purpose of our God and Savior, uh, Jesus Christ. And so the church is supremely important in this book. And we'll notice some beautiful principles today about that. But friend, as we talk about the church, it's important for us to understand what exactly we're talking about. When someone says, where do you go to church? Or when you hear the word church, what do you think of? Well, oftentimes we think about things that may not really catch the biblical idea of the church. The word church in the New Testament, ecclesia, literally means a called out or the assembly. It's the, it's the people who are in Christ who have come out of the world and are now belonging to the Lord Jesus Christ. That being true, let's realize the church is not a couple of things that it often is labeled as. The church is not the building. Friend, don't get me wrong. The church often assembles in a location that we might think of uh, as that, but the church is not the building. The Bible says in Acts 7, verse 48 through 50, that God does not dwell in temples made with hands. Heaven is your throne, earth is your footstool. God says, what house will you build for me? God owns and all things belong to Him. Therefore, we're not building an edifice for God. The church is more than just the building. Romans 12 verse 5, Paul says, You 
are the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 27 through 29, he says, you are the body of Christ and individually members one of another. And so it's not a building. It's the people that belong to Christ. The church is not a, a glorified social club. It's not like a, a political party. It's not a, just a feel-good place. The church is God's eternal plan where all the people who are called out of the world and into Christ are located at. It's the collecting place for all the saved who have obeyed the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That being true, let's then think about, in the book of Ephesians, let's think about from each chapter one beautiful picture of that place, that location, what it's like in the Bible. First, let's notice from Ephesians chapter 1 that the church is the body. Now, we're going to notice two ideas here, but they go hand in hand. I want you to look in your Bible in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. Remembering that the church is the body, here's what the Bible says. And He, that is God, put all things under His feet, Jesus' feet, and gave Him to be head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills all in all. Now, notice this with me. The Bible teaches, we learn from this passage about the church being the body, that Christ is the head, right? The Bible says, and He is the head of the body, which is the church. Friend, please understand, as we think about the Lord's church today, I hope you'll listen real carefully. We do not need, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is not decapitated. It does not need a human head. It has a head already, our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus still has all authority in heaven and on earth. Matthew 28, verses 18 and 19. God's Word is already settled in heaven. Psalm 119, verse 89. Jesus is reigning currently as head of the church at the right hand of the Father. Hebrews 1, verses 3 and 4. And that being true, we don't need to add to nor take away from the Word of God to try to impose on the church a human head, someone in, in some place, wherever it may be, Rome, Italy, whatever it may be, to try to put them as the head of the church, my friend, you have just made the church into a two-headed monster. And that's not the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. The church has one head, our Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't need my help and yours. He's still reigning from heaven. And friend, here's what's amazing. Not only is Jesus the head of this body, but notice it's in this body that all spiritual blessings exist. Ephesians 1 verse 3, all spiritual blessings are ours in Christ. If I want to have every blessing that the Father wants to bestow on man, where's that located at? In the body, in Christ. You see, prayer is a great blessing, right? Matthew 6, verse 9, the Bible teaches us pray, Our Father who art in heaven. Where's that blessing found? In Christ. Forgiveness. What an awesome spiritual blessing. When we hear the words of Acts 2, verse 38, we repent and are baptized and all our sins are washed away. We have the forgiveness of sins. Where's that at? In Christ, in His body. Fellowship. Acts 2, verse 42, we have fellowship with God and with one another. That closeness. Where's that at? All spiritual blessings are in the body. And friend, the Bible teaches in Ephesians chapter 1 that redemption is found in the body. I want you to notice Ephesians 1 verse 7. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace, which He's made to bound toward us all in wisdom and prudence. Where's redemption at? In Christ, in His body. You can't separate Christ from the body, right? Can, can a person separate the head from the body? Of course not. The body dies. You can't do that. Christ and the body are inseparable. He's the head. We're the body. Those two are so uniquely tied together that, friend, in Christ and in the body is where we find redemption, to, 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 to be bought back to God, to have the beauty of salvation and forgiveness. Romans 6.23 says this, the Bible teaches that although all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, the free gift of God is eternal life 
in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 6, verse number 23. Now, as we think about the church as the body, let's then think in chapter 2, not only about it just as the body, but let's think about the church as the place where reconciliation takes place. I want you to look in your Bible in Ephesians chapter 2 with me and notice what the Scripture will say about this idea in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. What else is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? It's where reconciliation takes place. For He Himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in His flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. And notice, and that he might reconcile them both to God, where? In one body, through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. You know, sometimes people think about the question, how important is the church? Well, friend, the church is where both Jew and Gentile, everybody is brought together to God in one body. You know, when I think about this idea of reconciliation, reconciliation carries the idea of to make friends again, to put aside differences and, and come together. Friend, how does that happen? What makes that possible? It happens because of God's grace. Ephesians 2 verse 8, by grace are you saved. By the mercy and grace of God, we have the privilege of being reconciled to God whom we were separated by sin. Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2. What makes that friendship possible again? Friend, it's made possible by the blood of Christ. Ephesians 1 verse 7, we're redeemed by His blood. Matthew 26 verse 28, Jesus, as the institute of the Lord's Supper said, This is my blood of the new covenant shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. It's the, it's the blood of Christ. It's the grace of God. And friend, because that wall of separation is taken down, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, no doubt a reference to the old Ten Commandment law, Old Testament, that's been taken out of the way. Therefore, we can have reconciliation through the cross in the body of Jesus Christ. Remember, the body is the church. Ephesians 1, verse 22 and 23. Without the church, you cannot be reconciled to the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see the importance and the essentiality of that church? Now, friend, I want you to listen again to something important here said, though. Oftentimes, people will try to say and teach that we still have to keep the Ten Commandments uh, to obey God and to be pleasing to Him. Friend, there is not a clearer passage in all the Bible that teaches we're not under the Ten Commandments and that that's been done away with more than Ephesians 2, verses 14 through 16. Look at what it says again in Ephesians 2, verse number 15. He's broken down the middle wall, verse 14. Verse 15, He has abolished in His flesh the enmity, listen now, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in Himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. Friend, at the cross of Jesus Christ, the Ten Commandment law was taken away. If men are going to be saved today, it's by the grace of God, it's by the blood of Christ, it's through the cross of Jesus Christ, and reconciliation occurs in the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Then in chapter 3, we think about the church as the eternal kingdom of God. Now friends, sometimes I'll hear people talk about uh, the kingdom, and they'll talk about it like it's a future event. They'll talk about the rapture and the tribulation, and when the Lord comes, He's going to come back, and He's going to set up His kingdom then and reign for a thousand years. Wait a minute now. There's only one problem with that. Well, there are multiple problems, but there's one major one. You're only 2,000 years too late because the Lord established His kingdom in the first century, and that kingdom is the eternal plan of God and it is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. This chapter clearly teaches the church has always been in the mind of God. I want you to look at Ephesians chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. To the intent now 
that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Don't miss this. According to the eternal purpose which He accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Friends, some people say well, the church was a band-aid. God implanted, intended to set up His kingdom. The Jews thwarted that plan. And so He kind of put the church in as a band-aid. And when He comes back, He's going to start the kingdom. No. The church is the eternal plan. It's what God intended to take the gospel to everybody. And listen to this now, don't miss this. According to His eternal purpose. Friend, the church is God's eternal plan, God's eternal purpose. It is God's kingdom today. How do we know that? In 2 Samuel 7, verses 12 through 14, God said to David, when your seed comes, I'm going to set a, a, kingdom, from, a kingdom from you through your seed. Uh, that kingdom will reign forever and of it there will be no end. Daniel 2 verse 44, Daniel was told that during the time of these four kings, the, uh, the Babylonians, the Medo-Persians, the Greeks, and the Romans, God would set up a kingdom that would never be destroyed. Here's what we know about that promise and that kingdom. In Luke 1 verse 32 and 33, the Bible says you'll call His name Jesus. He'll be great. He'll be the Son of the Lord God highest, and, the, and God will give him the throne of his father David, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Well, what is that kingdom? The kingdom is the church. Listen to Mark 9, verse 1. Jesus said to his disciples, Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here today who will not taste death until you see the kingdom present with power. Now, friend, Jesus promised his immediate disciples they would see the kingdom. Did that happen? You bet it did. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, and 19, And I say to you that you're Peter, and I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth you will also or already be bound in heaven. Jesus promised to build the church, and Peter was going to take the keys, the gospel message in Acts 2, and open up the doors of the kingdom, which is the church. And so what is the church? It's the eternal purpose of God. It's God's plan for the saved. And it's God's people who are going to preach the message of salvation to a lost and dying world. Now, friend, as we think about that church, let's also realize that in Ephesians chapter 4, the church is seen as a singular body. I want you to listen real carefully to what we're saying here. We have a host of religious organizations that exist today. Some have suggested that there may be as many as three to 5,000 mainstream religious organizations in the United States of America. Friend, I want to ask you to think from your Bible with me about this question. Did the Lord intend for it to be that way? In the book of Ephesians, how is the church seen? Friend, there was only ever it was only ever God's intent for there to be one church. You say, what? How do we know that? I want you to look in your Bible in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 following. The Word of God records this. The Bible says, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Now, these ones, it's, we can tell from the mentioning here that they're all one in nature and one in number as well. Is there more than one God? Of course not. Is there more than one faith? No. It has oneness in purpose and in its nature. Now, back up to the very first words of Ephesians 4 verse 4. There is one body. Let's think about that for a moment. Now what is the body? Ephesians 1 verse 22 and 23, which we noticed earlier, said this, And God put all things under His feet, under Christ's feet, and gave Him to be head over all things to the church, don't miss this, which is His body. Alright, let's think about this biblically speaking. The Bible teaches the body is the church. When we hear the word body, we hear the word church, we know those are synonyms because the Bible told us so in Ephesians 1 22 and 23. Now notice again Ephesians 4 verse 4, there is one body. If the body is the church and there's only one body, how many churches did the Lord ever intend to build? Listen to Jesus' own words on this. Matthew 16 verse number 18, Jesus said unto Peter, 
And I say to you that you're Peter, and on these rocks I'll build my churches. No, that's not what he said. And I say to you that you're Peter, and on this rock, singular, I am the Christ, the Son of the living God. I will build my church, singular. You were called into one body, and be ye thankful. Colossians 3 verse 15. There are many members. Listen to the emphatic nature of this statement. There are many members, yet but one body. 1 Corinthians 12, verse number 20. Friend, it was never God's plan for there to be a, a denomination here and a denomination there and a religious group named after this individual, a religious group named after that. No. Division, denominationalism, more than one church. That was never God's plan. We're making the plea as we read the book of Ephesians. Let's go back to the church that we read about in the New Testament, that singular body of all the saved that brings glory and honor to our God. All right then, in Ephesians chapter 5, we're now going to notice that the church is pictured as the beautiful bride of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want you to look in Ephesians chapter 5 with me, and let's notice these words. In Ephesians chapter 5, look in verse 22 following. Paul is talking about Christ in the church, and he uses marriage as an illustration. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and He's the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for her, that He might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the Word, that He might present her to Himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does, his, does the church. Now listen, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Friend, when we think about the church, when we think about Christ, we're the body. Christ is the head, or to use the illustration here, Christ is the husband, we're the, we're the bride. He is the one who we are to be submissive to. Uh, wives, be submissive to your own husbands. Paul says, I'm really not talking about husbands and wives here. I'm talking about Christ in the church. What's the lesson then? The church is be submissive to Christ, right? Colossians 3, verse 17. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ is the head just like the husband is the head of that marriage. He's the head of the church. We follow His leadership and guidance. Just as a husband is to have unimaginable, sacrificial love for his wife, friend, you can be glad to know and thankful to know that's how Christ loved the church. He literally gave himself for the church. John 3, verse 16, he purchased the church with his own blood. Acts 20, verse 28, and friend, as the Lord's church, just as a wife ought to honor her husband, uh, live in a good way to do that, the church should be holy. 1 Peter 1 verse 15, Be holy as He who called you is holy. And so there's a beautiful picture in the book of Ephesians chapter 5 about the church. Now, let's get that final beautiful picture that we see of the church in the book of Ephesians. And it's this. The church is the spiritual army of the Lord. We're enlisted in the Lord's army. We are fighting a, a terrible enemy in a spiritual battle, but we have a privilege to serve the greatest commander of all, our Lord and Savior. Look at Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 following. The Bible says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with the truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, 
taking the shield of faith with which you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Friend, you know, when you serve, people who have served in military have a great sense of pride, accomplishment, patriotism in doing that. Christians are in the greatest army ever. We're in the Lord's army. We follow the greatest captain, Jesus Christ. Hebrews 2, verses 9 and 10, He's the captain of our souls. He is leading us down the greatest path of victory ever to heaven itself, true spiritual freedom in heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, Jesus taught us in John 14, 6 that if we follow Him, we can receive that crown of life, mentioned also in Revelation 2, verse 10. My friend, let's realize this also. Right here and now, Christians are in a, a spiritual battle that we've got to wake up prepared for every day. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual host of wickedness. We have the devil and sin and wickedness as our enemy. And be sure the devil's doing his part. He's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But friend, we want to close on this positive idea. Yes, we are in a, uh, an awesome spiritual battle, but I want you to know two things. Stay faithful, number one, and you will be victorious. The Bible says this is the victory we have, even our faith. 1 John 4, verse 4, Jesus has already won the battle. Hebrews 2, verse 14, He has defeated the devil, and all those who follow Him will live with Him forever. And secondly, not only if you're faithful will you win the battle, but friend, you've been armed in such a way that if we keep our armor up, the devil can't get to you. You've got everything you knew. Belt of truth, gospel shoes, uh, shield of faith, sword of the Spirit, uh, the fiery darts, the wicked one cannot quench us. We've got the breastplate of righteousness. If we put on the, the fruit of the Spirit, if we try to live like a Christian every day, if we realize we can do all things through Christ and we wake up with the mindset that I'm going to battle, I'm going to live for the Lord, I'm going to do my best every day. Friend, you cannot, listen to me, you cannot be defeated if you put your trust in God and His spiritual armor. The Bible says this. 1 John 5 verse 4 says, He that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. Friend, we hope and pray today that you're a member of the Lord's church. And if you are, keep fighting the fight. One day, heaven will be our reward. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as video and audio from our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. You can also reach us by emailing mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call us at 844-6-GOSPEL or write to us at the address on your screen. You can also get our Gospel of Christ app on your handheld devices for those on the go. Gospel of Christ.